Glory to Jesus Christ. So today is Monday, March 8th. The Feast of John of the Cross. I mean, not John of the Cross. John of God. Excuse me. John of God. And the Monday of the third week of Lent. So let's say, uh, and we'll have today as our Catechism of the Catholic Church and the sacrament section, the mysteries. And let's begin by calling on the Holy Spirit to direct us and enlighten us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and enkindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit and they shall be created and you shall renew the face of the earth. Let us pray. O God, who instructed the hearts of the faithful by the light of the same Holy Spirit, grant that by the gift of the same Spirit we may be always truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolation. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And we today, as I said, it's the Feast of St. John of the Cross. He was a farmer, came from a farming family, and went off to, in, to become a soldier, I believe a mercenary, and uh, he got involved with gambling addiction and all sorts of, of things. And uh, he had a conversion experience at the age of 40. And he tried being a merchant as well. And uh, he lived from 1495 to 1550. And he, the Lord called him to give his life completely to God, to open his heart to Christ, to repent of his sins, to uh, make frequent use of the sacraments, to, uh, to li live a new life. In fact, the Lord was calling him to ministry to the sick in a special way. And so so from then on, he lived at the service of the sick in Granada in Spain. I went to, saw his, his tomb, magnificent, uh, and the hospital he founded. But uh, he was, he had to uh, hide out so that the debtors would not arrest him because he had gone so in so much debt to have a hospital for the, uh, the poor sick. And there's still a hospital, a nice modern hospital there today. And he founded what would become known as the Order of the Brothers Hospitalers of St. John of God. So they would call him of God because uh, he had such compassion that, and, and such a devout life of a prayer. He became a priest. And uh, so that's it. He's, uh, he founded this congregation, the Hospitalers of St. John of God, or at least I think he became a priest. There it is, St. John of God, a great example, especially uh, and a good prayer partner to have during this pandemic. And here we are. So the sac we were on page 292 in the forest green colored a second edition, the large, large one, not the small one, uh, of the second edition of the Catechism of the Catholic Church, page 292, but in any uh, edition that you have, the, the, the revised, revived edition, uh, Roman numeral 5, 1130, 1130. The church celebrates the mystery of her Lord until he comes, when God will be everything to everyone. 1 Corinthians 11, 26 and 15, 28. Again, mystery, we've talked about this is, this is in the section called the celebration of the Christian mystery. And they have it in the singular rather than the plural. Uh, if, the, if this were... Uh, from a, an Eastern Christian perspective, they would have used the plural, the mysteries. And mystery isn't 
oh, it's just, we just can't, uh, this doesn't make sense, so we'll just uh, say, oh, the, the, we, there's no way of, of, of uh, communicating this or, or explaining it in any way. Well, of course, anything dealing with God, the infinite and the eternal, is going to be beyond a full description. And especially the inner life of God, the, the, the reality of the Trinity, and here also the reality of the very energy of God, the, his grace. And the sacraments are these great signs of grace, great channels of grace, and, and the importance of the materiality used in this, since we're material beings, uh, we're, uh, we will be resurrected in body. We're not going to end up as ghosts or angels. We will be resurrected because you are your body as well as you are your soul. Or if you prefer the, the three, uh, three demarcations, body, the, uh, the materiality, and soul and spirits, or, or mind, some people say mind and spirit. Uh, with that spirit being the sort of uh, center of yourself, your the incorporeal uh, spiritual center of yourself, which is uh, even deeper than uh, mind. Uh. So, God will be everything to everyone. And that's what we're called to right now, for God to be everything to me and i place everything in him all my relationships all of my possessions everything all of my expectations all of that and that detachment that comes from developing that more and more is a great liberation because it's often this being attached to what will people think of me what will people what are people saying about me what are people not saying about me, all of that, uh, that can get in the way of serenity and of, indeed of happiness. And often some little thing, some little slight in the day can just ruin everything, but that's, it only ruins everything because we give in to it, because we're more attached to that than we are to, uh, to the pursuit of serenity, than the pursuit of of all of these things. But, and of course, the more you act in love and the more uh, emotionally engaged you are in love and objects of love, there's going to be hurt. There's going to be disappointment. And, and sadly, there will be rejection at times. And uh, then we find of people that we've invested our lives in, uh, they're not interested in us anymore. So we, we have that or people uh, all sorts of things like that and uh, but the more we attach ourselves to to God the more we focus on God and practice that detachment that everything with everything we're going to leave behind except everything we put into God's hands and so everything God will be everything to everyone. So we pray that that the uh, that that all accept this. No one's going to be forced. No one is forced, ever has been, or will be forced to cooperate with grace. To no one is going to be forced to go into the state of heaven. Uh, only volunteers go to heaven, but only volunteers go to hell, even more so. So by mortal sin embracing mortal sin and refusing to give that up uh, and uh, refusing to have the reign of God in our lives. So uh, uh, that's hell. That would be. And if, they, if, uh, if the resurrected people of hell were put placed in a material paradise, it would become very hellish very, very soon because of the attitudes, the reality of sin and all that. That's in it. They would wreck it all. So, uh, so we have to make sure that we're not citizens of hell, but citizens of heaven, living in the power of the grace, especially the grace God pours out through cooperation with hearing 
and receiving his word and hearing and receiving the sacraments and participating in the sacraments. Since the apostolic age, the liturgy, which is, as I mentioned before, the public worship of the church, the official worship, the liturgy has been drawn towards its goal by the Spirit's groaning, groaning in the church, so within us. So the, uh, the more we become people of faith, hope, and love, the more the yearning for the fulfillment is there, the more the yearning for complete and unobstructed uh, communion with God and in God, that communion with everybody who is in God, who is in, in that grace. And the struggles of that, especially when we see the uh, sorrows brought about by sin, not to mention the sorrows and pains brought up about by nature as it is. So, and, and they have the expression here, Maranatha, which is one of the few Aramaic words in the Bible. I mean, no, well, in the New Testament. Uh, the New Testament's written in Greek, Koine Greek, but there are phrases of Aramaic in it. Hosanna, uh, which actually might be Hebrew, but I think it is Aramaic, and Maranatha, and Amen. Yeah, we get that well, also from Hebrew. But uh, I remember a professor that Father Hickey, my pastor, and I both had, Father King, uh, when we were in the seminary, and how he lamented uh, his focus was the Old Testament. He was an archaeologist as well, although uh, Father Hickey had him for New Testament. So uh, he was very good in, in languages, in, in Greek and Hebrew, among other things, and uh, in his research in this. And uh, he lamented in the, uh, after Vatican II, the changes in the liturgy, that they got rid of uh, Sabaoth in the, uh, the translation of the Sanctus, you know, the, the Latin Sanctus, 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 Dominus Deus Sabaoth. Or Sabbath, and that of hosts, but it was the uh, heavenly hosts there, the uh, angels and all, and uh, so he lamented that we got rid of that, because he said, uh, you know, every uh, Semiticism that we had of uh, showing our root was very important. At least they kept Hosanna, and uh, but uh, Maranatha was something that uh, uh, is. I don't think in liturgical texts, but is in hymns, a lot of hymns. And um, so it, it depends on how you break up the word. It's either is the Lord is coming or come, O Lord. And both of them are really Advent uh, proclamations and uh, the proclamation as we're awaiting the quite literal second coming of Christ, that he will come and all will know it, all will see it. How that's going to happen, I don't know. But Jesus did say at his ascension that he would be returning. Uh, they will see him returning as he had left. So uh, uh, that's what my expectation is or something uh, for that. Will I see it? Will you see it? Maybe. You never know. Before this class ends, maybe the world will end. Maybe a giant uh, asteroid the size of, of, of Mars... Well, we're not likely like that you detect. Uh, we, it's good, about to crash into the Earth in uh, in twenty eight minutes. What if that would? If you don't get panically now. I'm just making this up. Uh, <coughs> then that would be the end. That would be the end. We would, would all go together. But uh, more likely, and who may the world might end in, you know, seven billion years. You know, when the sun expands or when the uh, uh, our galaxy collides with another galaxy, so what, what, all sorts of things happen. Uh, that might be the end of our Earth, uh, you know, into a baked cinder or less. Uh, but uh, you and I are not going to be around then. Reminds me of a joke of this uh, uh, young freshman in college, university, 
in the middle of the afternoon, and he was sort of, he was at a, a lecture on, uh, uh, on astronomy. And he's beginning to, to nod off, and the professor says, well, maybe in seven billion years, the sun is going to expand and perhaps envelop the earth, and that will be it. And then the, the, the young man uh, sort of wakes up, and then he raises his head and says, Professor, excuse me, uh, when did you say that was going to happen? He said, oh, maybe five, seven billion years. And he said, the guy said, Phew, I thought you said five to seven million years. Da, 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 da. So that's not going to make, he's going to be long gone. We're all going to be long gone. That, so we are facing our own uh, personal judgment uh, before we have the general judgment, which is at the end, at the resurrection. Uh, so we and and that's good. It's just as important. And and uh, you know, since we trans, will be trans, will be able to transcend time, and time will run out in one sense. Uh, if there's no more Earth, uh, to spin around the sun, of uh, days and seconds and all that, it will end. That would be bygone. Uh, but uh, and you could say, well, maybe it, everything is compressed in one now or something. I don't know. It's, uh, uh, that's interesting speculation, but that's what it is. But uh, there will be this general judgment. So we're praying and for, and the second coming and the resurrection, and every tear will be wiped away from those who uh, die in grace. Uh, and uh, there'll be paradise, uh, because we, we're going to have uh, bodies. So even though they can pass through doors and do all the stuff that, the body of the resurrected body of Jesus did, and uh, bilocate and trilocate and tricyclate and all that, uh, and uh, we won't be uh, chained by time and space, but still, uh, we'll have a physicality in uh, which assumes some sort of placeness uh, for our materiality, which will be immortal and. Uh, We'll be able to exercise all the preternatural gifts and all that stuff, but uh, and of course this is by faith. Although it, it's the more uh, physics you get into the speculations of physics, the more it sort of sounds like metaphysics in a lot of ways. Uh, but uh, the uh, the paradoxes of everything are increasingly real to me, of of every truth, uh, but. Uh, so we have to be ready. Maranatha, come, O Lord, because uh, the Lord is coming. And Maranatha is quoted in in 1 Corinthians 16, 22. Maranatha. The liturgy thus shares in Jesus' desire, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you. And Jesus still does at Mass, which is our Passover, which is the uh, the Jewish Passover, we Christians believe, is a prefiguration of the Eucharist, which is a, a universal Passover for a Catholic Passover for all people, not just for uh, the Israelite people, but for all people. And I always enjoy celebrating Passover with Jewish people. Uh, and uh, I've also been to uh, uh, Judeo-Christian Passovers, or uh, Passovers that were uh, geared even for just Gentiles, uh, Christians. I've been that I've enjoyed those. But the uh, but the, the Eucharist is our Passover, our daily Passover. I was listening to the journey home one time, and there's a man who's. Uh, his mother was Catholic, but she wasn't particularly practicing. And the father was Jewish, and he wasn't terribly practicing. But his grandmother, his Jewish grandmother, was very practicing and was a very eager. So uh, he was, and his parents seem to have been what, uh, in what Alan Dershowitz called an interfaithless marriage. But I don't know. I might be remembering details that were not part of his 
uh, testimony, but, uh, but he was raised Jewish. And he converted, uh, ultimately after that, through scripture, but, uh, uh, to actually a personal encounter with Jesus, and uh, became a Catholic, and became a priest. And someone said, well, don't you miss Passover? He said, oh, no, I have Passover much more than I did before I became a completed Jew. Uh, I celebrate Mass every day. So that's it. And that's why in the Western uses, we have unleavened bread, the host, because the Last Supper was a Passover in all probability, and uh, they couldn't use leavened bread. Although, of course, the Catholic Church is open to the particular traditions of all the equal churches of the particular churches within the Catholic Church of the Papal Communion here there. So the most of the many of the most of the Eastern rites use leavened bread, and uh, and actually according to their liturgical tradition, are it's illicit to use unleavened bread, while in the Western tradition it's illicit to use leavened bread, or at least that's been the way it's been for, let's say, a thousand years. Um, uh, I was reading someone who said that the, the West got this from the Armenians, which is interesting because the Armenians started with unleavened bread uh, before, but I don't know if that's, uh, that's been proven, but nonetheless. So I've earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you, and so he does. So uh, and, and we should uh, get to Mass as often as we can. Uh, now in this pandemic, it's harder. And now, you know, when, when I was young, which was you know, in the late Bronze Age, uh, but uh, we had, they had started up evening Masses, daily evening Masses. And that made it possible for me when I was in high school and then college to go to daily mass. And that became a, a crucial part of my prayer life, my life in general. And in some ways the whole day was centered around that. So I'd do all this stuff to make sure I was able to get to mass. Occasionally uh, it was impossible, but usually I was able to get to mass sometimes more than once uh, on, on a weekday. And if they didn't have the evening mass, it wouldn't have happened. So I lament the that uh, Evening Masses, uh, daily Masses seems so rare. My parish, St. Catherine's in Somerville, they had three Masses a day when I was in high school. And, and also in college, I believe, they had three Masses. And uh, one of them was this 5.30 Mass at, uh, in the lower church every, every weekday. And, uh, and I think before 1970, they had... They had a Saturday evening mass before they started up Saturday evening masses. I think they had one for Saturday, but I might be wrong with that. So, so I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. So some say, well, that means that in the in heaven there will be no sacrament. So that because the sign you don't need the sign anymore uh, but I've also heard an argument for that uh, there that the Eucharist is celebrated in heaven and uh, our reception of it would be of such great intensity or something because we're gonna have bodies and all that stuff over there I'll leave that up for uh, speculative theologians to discuss uh, I myself actually think there will be uh, some and, and uh, but so, um, in the sacraments, uh, uh, that was Jesus in uh, uh, Luke twenty two fifteen. I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And so, it was fulfilled in the kingdom of God by Jesus' death and resurrection. But even more so in his second coming. In the sacraments of Christ, the Church already rece receives the guarantee of her inheritance and even now shares in everlasting life. So uh, grace is everlasting life, and we're sharing in that. 
But uh, will it really be everlasting to us if we persevere, if we cooperate with grace? Yes. Because there's no, there's no irresistible grace and there's no, well, I have this grace and now I have a loophole so I can commit all the mortal sins I want and, and God will just overlook them. No, it doesn't work. People who have that attitude, I'm afraid, are in for a terrible and uh, damnatory shock at the end. But let's hope not. Let's hope they don't go that way. While awaiting our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And that's uh, from Titus 2.13. The spirit of the bride say come. So we had gone over this before, but I think it was worth going over again. And then there was the in brief that we had done. So let's go now to page 294. 294, chapter 2, chapter 2 of this section, the sacramental celebration of the Paschal Mysteries. Paschal meaning the Passover and the Paschal Mysteries, especially the, the, the Paschal event of Christ. The, uh, his death and resurrection in particular. This is 1135. The catechesis of the liturgy entails, first of all, catechesis is the uh, religious instruction, the uh, spiritual instruction and examination of the liturgy, entails uh, liturgy, emphasizing here the sacramental liturgy, rather than the liturgy of the hours, but rather than, you know, matins and lauds and vespers and the like, but the sacraments. Entails, first of all, an understanding of the sacramental economy. And remember, we had talked about economy, a law of the household. It doesn't mean um, home economy, how to uh, balance your budget. But uh, or or the uh, national economy or anything like that, no, not the financial status or health of something. Uh, it means the uh, the law of the household, of how especially how God relates outside of Himself to us, and also His mercy. Is it, but in, often in the uh, in uh, in the Greek theology, in the the talk about. Where the akribea, the severity of the strictness of uh, moral uh, demands, but then the economia, the forgiveness and the uh, accommodation, shall we say, the, 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 uh, this isn't a compromise here, this is accommodation, so to something. So an example of that would be, let's say, uh, you know, a priest realizes that this was a mistake, that he was not called to ordination, and he wants to marry, and he gets laicized. Now, the sacrament is still there. The, the mark of the priesthood is still there, but there's this leniency, there's this exercise of compassion in, in that. So, but uh, that's another thing. But economy here means how this uh, is worked out, how God distributes his grace in this situation. In this light, the innovation of its celebration, and uh, celebration is italicized there, is revealed. So uh, there's, there's a continuity with the sacraments, quote unquote, of the old law of you know, circumcision, the sacrificial system, uh, uh, things like that, the various and, and the various uh, rituals that had. Uh, salvific significance, but we're actually pointing to something that would be the fulfillment, which would be the sacraments of, uh, to Jesus Christ, and in him the sacraments of the new covenant. So the celebration, and the celebration of this is different in the different rites of the church, and, and, and different uses often, so they have to, so the Mass is not, well, I remember when I was uh, nine, the, I heard that the Mass is the same all over the world. It was, it was just starting to change, I think. 
when I was nine. Uh, but before that, it was the uh, the uh, the uh, Tridentine Mass was more or less the same, but actually, of course, it was totally the same everywhere. And of course, in the Western Rite, they were still living Western Rites, uh, other than like the you know, the Ambrosian Rite, the uh, and uses like the use of Braga, the use of Lyon, stuff like that, which are would be uh, closer to the Tridentine. That it was uh, the Roman Mass at a particular time, uh, celebrated in a particular place, and then it sort of stayed there, and that as the uh, it evolved more in with the others, uh, uh, other, other groups, uh, like uh, you know, the adding of the, the last gospel or whatever, the prayers of faithful, different things, different and, and customs that they had that uh, perhaps were much more common, but they were gone. And then there were rites that were suppressed, the Gallican rite, which I think is very unfortunate, and then rites that basically became museum pieces, like the Mozarabic rite. Which is very different uh, from uh, my uh, my memory of reading about it. Uh, I was hoping when I was in uh, uh, Toledo in Spain that we would be able to get to the, but we couldn't. Uh, with the the bus that was taking us, it was it was we couldn't make the the, the mass, which was all in Latin anyway. The Mozarabic Mass, except I think the epistle was done in Arabic, and I think maybe they repeated the readings in Spanish, but I I don't know, I didn't go, so I never saw it. So there were all these different rites, and then and now there are you know expressions from Vatican II like the Zaire and rite, and there was a, a talk of an Indian rite, which I don't think ever got off the ground. Stuff like that, but there, there are all the uh, so these are basically Western rites adapted, uh, and then of course there are many Eastern rites from the families, the different liturgical families, the uh, the Egyptian family, the Coptic family, which ha takes in the uh, Egyptian liturgy of the, the Coptic Church or the Coptic Catholic Church in Egypt. And the the Alexandrian liturgy. This is the Alexandrian uh, family, and then the Ethiopian, and then the subsets of that, the Eritrean, and so like. And uh, so that, uh, in some ways, there were some things that uh, they had influenced the Western rites on uh, 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 with that. And then there's the the Syrian rites, and there are the two. Uh, and that they're divided into two, West Syrian and East Syrian, or Aramean and uh, Chaldean. Uh, and from the, uh, the West, the East Syrian, we have the Malabarese, right, which is, uh, I think, the second largest uh, uh, Eastern Catholic rite after the Byzantine. Uh, and... Uh, and then the West Syrian, you have uh, something with something called West Syrian or uh, Aramean, sometimes it's called now. And uh, the uh, the Mela, Melancharis in India, which is from the West Syrian there. And then the uh, we have those. And then we have uh, the uh, the Byzantine, which in many ways. Uh, is was strongly influenced by the Assyrian liturgy, especially the West Syrian liturgy, and uh, it developed all that. And then we have, and that's the the largest with all you know the Greek and Russian and the two recensions, what they call it, of or or uh, of or uses major uses the Slavic and the Greek, and the and then we have the Armenian. We have the Armenian, which is its own beautiful liturgy. And I think that covers it for the families of the Eastern. So uh, so we have this, so there's different modes of celebration, different fashions. So if you go, let's say, to a Coptic liturgy, and you don't know any Arabic, and you definitely don't know any Coptic, uh, you could be completely lost. So, like, if you heard things, you, you, you'd say, oh, that's... 
that's so that's the those are the words of institution it's a, but you won't hear it because the the outer dress is so different to this but it is this basically the same it is uh, the mass so when they were saying that in uh before vatican II that the mass was always the same it was a bit of truth to it but not the same as being identical it definitely was not and actually never has been and uh the so uh, if you went to that you could be completely lost but that's as much a mass as everything else and then of course the different uh, uh, particular churches of the east have their own canon law uh, and, and uh, customs such as uh, married clergy being the rule for parish clergy in many of the rites eastern rites and uh, and the like all the, and, and all these different customs and I think I mentioned before how people sometimes fought over this, as if Jesus did all this stuff at the Last Supper when he didn't. So if you wanted to have it just like the Last Supper, you would have to have a Passover uh, meal, per se, and recline, and you know, all this other stuff at that. Although, I believe it's John Gregory Dix who said from his study of the Talmud uh, that uh, incense was probably used at the Last Supper. But... Um, I wasn't there, so I can't tell you. The uh, so all of these different different rites have that. But the different modes of celebration. Vive les différences. Long live the differences. How rich this makes it. And we can get a lot of this now because a lot of the uh, services of the different rites are online. You know, they were live streamed during this pandemic, and you can find them on YouTube, uh, and often in English. Well, you know, the uh, Byzantine rite, anyway, English, the Arme the Maronite rite, I didn't mention the Maronite rite, that's a, uh, a West Syrian rite, and uh, it's the largest West Syrian rite in the Catholic Church, and it's the only rite that has no non-Catholic equivalent, to the best of my knowledge. So, um, what all the others do, including the Tridentine, uh, have groups outside the full communion with the, uh, the Catholic Church of the Papal Communion. So celebration, and that's important. And um, there was a comedian who ridiculed the, using the word saying, celebrating the Mass. And he just did not see this as a celebration because he didn't know what it really was. Or did he, he didn't care to know. Um, uh, who became a, a rather... Uh, uh, infamous anti-Catholic uh, in his uh, later days, but um, uh, but it is a celebration. So often we think it's over. Oh, you have to have balloons and all this, which is often uh, marred and made uh, sort of ridiculous. Some attempts to uh, make this more celebratory, like clown masses and stuff like that, are doing that, which is. Uh, thankfully, I think, uh, a historical footnote for the most part. But, um, but the, the, liturgy, the liturgy can be celebrated solemnity. So they can be very solemn celebrations and that, and very dignified celebrations. And so uh, uh, that, so uh, it rightly said, you know, you're celebrating a solemn high mass, but it, it's, it is celebration. So, so this is, this is about the sacraments of the church. It was the diversity of liturgical traditions that we mentioned, and is common to the celebration of the seven sacraments. So the, what, what we have, all the rites have as, as the basics in this. And so the questions are, who celebrates the liturgy? Well, we all do. But the, uh, the priest is the celebrant of the this uh, except for the usual the main celebrant well a bishop can do it because the bishop has the fullness of the priesthood except for ordination only a bishop a validly ordained bishop can validly ordain and when is the liturgy celebrated well it depends or if you're thinking of the liturgy of the hours at different times where is the liturgy celebrated well uh, rightfully in church, but in varied circumstances, especially emergencies, 
uh, anywhere. Article one, celebrating the church's liturgy. Who celebrates? Question one. Liturgy is an action of the whole Christ, and an action is put in a ta in uh, in quotes here, of the whole Christ, with whole Christ put in italics. Christus totus. So head and body. So we're all joined together in this. So when a a, pre, they, a priest uh, in a, a situation of persecution is is doing a whispered, hurried mass in a, the, a laundry room of a hospital, which is a bishop in uh, Prague did during the persecutions, the communist persecutions there, uh, or uh, in a, a Vietnamese a cardinal who's uh, causes being examined for beatification. When he was in uh, imprisonment, someone smuggled in a little bit of wine in this uh, vial, the, this little bottle that was supposed to be his medicine, uh, and this had the medicine on, but it was actually wine. He took a tiny drop and put it in his hand because he didn't have a chalice or anything like that. And they smuggled in hosts, these little hosts in which he would use that, he'd break up a portion of that and, and uh, put that in his other hand. And uh, what he had memorized from the Mass, he would say that. And that, so, but though that is definitely extraordinary circumstances. So the usual place for this action is on a consecrated altar in, or uh, in, uh, in a church. And I remember in the 19, early 1970s, it would be trendy. We had a beautiful church, plenty of room, but they wanted the folk mass in the hall so people could uh, have their folding chairs and all this stuff. And it was up on, on a stage, on a table, on, on, a, on a, uh, a folding table. And uh, no uh, altar stone, no uh, intermension or anything like that. And intermension is a cloth in the Byzantine rite of a uh, Byzantine church, uh, which there's a relic in it, and it depicts uh, Christ in the tomb or Christ being taken down from the cross in the, on that. And that's the altar, uh, portable altar. So, um, but they didn't have that or anything because like they wanted to be informal and all this stuff. So, and those were the days of, uh, of, uh, very interesting things, but thank God it's for the most part gone. That, um, well, anyway, uh, instead of doing it in the church, which would then, uh, I remember I was at a Taze a, a, a youth thing in uh, Libertyville, in a, at a, a, a uh, out in the, uh, in the, is it Catskills, I think, there, and, um, in these mountains, in this way in the middle of the country, in the middle of nowhere. And uh, so I was there for the week. And so a few of us, one guy who was uh, Eastern Orthodox and myself, they said, well, you can uh, set up, you can decorate for this. So we did this, and, and uh, one of the brothers came in, because we had a cross, we had, we had, uh, we found stuff, because it was a girl's, a Episcopal girl's, we found uh, church stuff. This was in the barn, mine because the little chapel would have been too small anyway. Um, uh, we found this beautiful altar covering and stuff like that. Yeah. He put that out. We had all this, we had candles out on this. And he said, oh, this is too churchy. As if that was uh, a criticism. As if that was, uh, so, and, and, uh, and we made a, the, my friend made a three bar cross, but someone criticized that because they thought it was the cross of Lorraine and it was a political statement. So we had to change, we had to turn it into a key row from uh, being the, the, the three bar Byzantine symphonic cross. So it's an action. So we have to participate in the, the, the mass, in the sacraments, in the liturgy, and not just be a bump on a log, but uh, participate, sing, you know, uh, sing when you go, well, now we're not supposed to sing in this pandemic, uh, follow along in a missalette, in a missal. 
pay attention to the readings, uh, answer the responses of the people, uh, and often prepare for this. It's good to prepare for read the readings beforehand when you come, but almost nobody does that, so you have to be realistic. Um, so the whole Christ. So those who even now celebrate it without signs are already in the heavenly liturgy. So those who are in heaven, they don't have to have the outer signs. With that, Where celebration is holy communion and feast. Holy, not H-O-L-Y, which it is, but holy H, uh, W-H-O-L-L-Y. So there's no, there's no veil. Now we're still, the, the veil is separating us from the heavenly divine liturgy and uh, is, is, is uh, often... Well, at, at times we may experience the veil slightly lifting, but the veil is still there. But the veil will be ripped at the uh, at the uh, general resurrection, and in heaven the veil is 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 gone. There's no separation. This distinction uh, among us, and always we will be totally unique. But we will be fulfilled and we will be in total communion with all those who are in God's grace. Because we'll be in total communion with the infinite and the eternal. Not that we will be infinite and eternal, but God is. And God communicates himself and his grace uh, to us fully. So uh, the, every liturgy is a yearning for that and is a foretaste of that. Really. The celebrants of the heavenly liturgy. The book of Revelation of St. John, that's the last book of the Bible, read in the church's liturgy, first reveals to us a throne stood in heaven. So the uh, Scott Heim, Dr. Scott Heim, underlined that the book of Revelation uh, uh, is a sort of program for the Mass, is revealing what the Mass really is, and, uh, and the heavenly aspect of it especially, the heavenly divine liturgy aspect of it. With all of the uh, the celebration, the incense, the vestments, all of the stuff there, but but the great temple uh, imagery put in it, and one is this throne there, a throne stood in heaven with one seated on the throne, and in uh, the uh, the Byzantine setup of the uh, holy of holies of the sanctuary. Behind the icon screen, so there's this screen of icons, uh, but and it's supposed to be a screen rather than a wall, but often it's a wall. And uh, so they open the gates there, and there's there's the altar, which is usually a cube-shaped thing. And on the altar, not only do we have the tabernacle or the Eucharistic dove or whatever, with the Eucharist uh, enthroned there on the holy throne of the altar. Uh, the holy table, uh, there's a seven branch candlestick, which uh, evokes the imagery of the book of Revelation, of the, the seven lamps and the seven lampstands. And, uh, and then the, often the, 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 there's a throne behind that, which is uh, usually vacant. At my monastery, they put the gospel book on it, but that can also be occupied by the bishop when he celebrates as a symbol of Christ uh, thrown there, uh, there, and the, there, so in in the church there are many of these uh, Book of Revelation uh, images put in, <clears throat> so the incense and all the in, in the uh, glittering vestments and all that would be a part of that in the Byzantine liturgy. So the Book of Revelation of Saint John, read in the church's liturgy, first reveals to us a throne stood in heaven with one seated on the throne. This is Revelation 4, 2, but which is evocative of the call of Isaiah when in, in, in the temple in Isaiah 6, 6, 1 and following, that he has this theophany, this vision of God, and, uh, and his, he was high and lifted up. His throne was high, exalted, and his train filled the temple, which was the the hem of his garment, you know, all this. So the, his glory was filling the whole temple. 
and so this uh, that there uh, so and who's on the throne it is the Lord God who's really there and also in the call of Ezekiel where he has uh, this this uh, sort of throne experience of God in Ezekiel 1, 26 and 28. So, uh, then it then shows the Lamb standing as though it had been slain, who is also on the throne. So, because the Trinity, you know, but the Lamb is Christ. Behold the Lamb of God, the one who fulfills the Passover, the one who fulfills all of the sacrifices and all of that. Uh, all of that is uh, prefiguring him. So standing, though he had been saved, so he's risen, but this is uh, but it's one slain. So uh, it can be said that uh, uh, that is pointing to the real presence of not only the of Christ in the Eucharist here on earth, but the real presence of his once offered sacrifice, which is perpetual, which is uh, which Jesus constantly. Uh, eternally indeed presents before the Father an image there of the pre Christ the priest presenting the offering of himself but caught up with himself is the offering of the whole universe uh, so uh, in the power of the Holy Spirit uh, and uh, in the Eastern liturgies and now in the Western liturgies uh, there's the epiclesis or epiclesis the invocation of the Holy Spirit upon the gifts that they may become the body and blood of, of Jesus Christ. And then an invocation on us, that we might truly be more and more members of this mystical body of Christ, and more and more prepared to receive Christ truly present in the Eucharist. So Christ, crucified and risen, the one high priest of the true sanctuary, the same one who offers and is offered. So that's from the liturgy of St. John Chrysostom. But it evokes a John 1, 29. And Hebrews 4, 14 and 15 and 10, 19. To, uh... So Christ is truly present. The same one who offers and is offered, who gives and is given. So, of course, he's, Jesus is God, and so in his godness, he is the one receiving this, uh, and not just the hypothesis of the Father or the Holy Spirit, but also there. But he is the gift. He's the one that's being given. And also, in a sense, the Father and the Holy Spirit, too, that's sort of part of the... the uh, the uh, communion of the Trinity that always is. And uh, there's an image, the perichoresis, perichoresis, which is uh, choresis, uh, which is a dance, like a, a, a line dance, where you're all connected, you're all holy. And then you weave in a circular line dance with this uh, uh, all, you know, moving together and all sort of in one there, that image of the Trinity, the three dancing in this because it's an image uh, and images of about the eternal and the infinite really limp but uh, it's a beautiful image and so um, finally it presents the river of the water of life flowing from the throne of God and the Lamb one of the most beautiful symbols of the Holy Spirit there the of this the water of life, Revelation uh, 22, 1. But about, about Jesus giving the, his water of life uh, of discourse here in John 4, 10, 14, 10 through 14. So, uh, recapitulated in Christ, this is on page 295, paragraph 1138. Recapitulated in Christ. These are the ones who take part in the service. Recapitulation means caught up in the head, anakephaliasis in Greek, that, that uh, uh, recapitulated, 
that if we were all caught up in Christ, and it would Christ as the head of everything. So uh, we capitulated in Christ. These are the ones who take part in the service of the praise of God and the fulfillment of his plan, the heavenly powers and all that. So uh, in the book of Revelation, that they're always singing uh, that uh, in pray, praises of God, and they always seem to know all the words, uh, and they don't seem to have to use missalettes or hymn books. Uh, and so, and a new song, this is a new song to the Lord, and they're uh, all singing and all assembled and investments with the white robes, the baptismal robes, the uh, albs there, uh, signifying that they've been completely washed clean of sin, that there's no uh, taint of sin left in them, that that's all been purged out, and they've been washed in the blood of the Lamb, which is a, a paradoxical image. So, of course, when you get a blood stain on, if you if you soak something in blood, well, good luck in getting that out. Leave them with oxy clean or whatever. Um, <clears throat> but here it's the it, it makes it white. So uh, it's sort of evocative of the image of Christ transfigured on the Mount of Tabor before the three apostles, Peter, James, and John, and the heavenly Elijah and Moses. Although I personally think that they probably both had a very strong purgatory because of the those last two. But anyway, uh, so and this has the heavenly powers, the angels, and all that. All creation who are symbolized by the four living creatures who have uh, aspects of uh, different quote unquote kingdoms. <coughs> Or sub kingdoms, even human, uh, mammalian, uh, avian, and uh, well, actually, two mammalians. They, they should have had a, a uh, someone from another kingdom, but anyway, but another uh, uh, set of, uh, of uh, animals. But uh, so they symbolize all of creation the human, human head. A uh, human face, and, and then the faces of the other animals uh, there uh, flying around, and uh, the four living beings, the four for the four quote unquote corners of the world, or even of the universe, because cosmos, cosmos, or cosmos could mean the world, but it could also mean the universe. But of course, at the time of Christ, they, the vast universe that we know of. Uh, they didn't know of. Uh, it, it seemed uh, it was a lot more concise, shall we say? They thought of that, you know, that everything was enclosed in a like sort of like a giant bubble sort of thing. But uh, anyway, the new people of God. So we're new, ever new. And so they are symbolized by the one hundred and forty-four thousand, which, uh, with all due respect to. Uh, Jehovah Witness uh, speculation on that. Uh, it's uh, symbolic. It's not a literal number. It's uh, and what is it? It's twelve times twelve. So Israel, the twelve tribes of Israel, times the apostles, the new Israel there, uh, uh, the uh, the Church of the Gentiles as well, the Universal Church, the Catholic Church, and. Uh, a thousand times a thousand, which is the symbol of uh, a numeric symbol for uh, almost uncountable. So, uh, well, of course, myriad ten thousand would be even more so. But uh, so there, were, so that's what that symbol is: the one hundred and forty-four thousand. In Revelation. Four. It does have here in the footnote too about Isaiah six, where again the uh, Isaiah six, which uh, about the you know the 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 animals and all this stuff, and Ezekiel 
you know, in Ezekiel, the Ezekiel is the one that the the, the the image of the 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 four living creatures comes from. So especially the martyrs slain for the word of God. So they're under the altar there in there and they're asking when will you uh, vindicate us? But they're uh, talking not just about themselves in heaven. They're talking about those on earth who are suffering. So they know what's going on on earth. And if they know what's going on on earth, then they can't be bothered in their bliss. Then we're morally superior to them, and spiritually superior to them, superior in compassion and all that, more godlike. But that isn't the case. They know what's going on, and they're praying for us, and they're uh, being channels of help to us, without their bliss being in any way uh, diminished by that. So that's like Christ. You know, Christ knows what's going on, but but his bliss is not in no way diminished. Yet his reality on the cross is still very strong of his bearing our sufferings. So and then, so the martyrs slain for the word of God. So uh, the martyrs are uh, historically the often considered the highest category of saint, with uh, of course the exception of Our Lady there, who is a uh, virtual martyr in many ways, there at the foot of the cross. And the all-holy, the Panagia, the, the Greek term for that, mother of God, who's the woman, the woman clothed with the sun, the woman who is taken by, because she bears what? She bears the one who will rule the, all the nations with the rod of iron. There's only one that that description fits, and that's Jesus. So this, the, the character there in uh, Revelation 7 is Mary. And of course, there are other the senses of Scripture, there are other levels, there are other things that the imagery can be applied to. But the one it applies to best and most fully is Mary. Yeah. You can say, well, it's the church, it's Israel, it's this, it's that, the other thing. So there are other different uh, senses, different levels of uh, 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 reading reading that, reading out of that, or even reading into that. So the bride of the Lamb is the church. And finally, a great multitude of people, of, 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 of no one can number, from every nation, from all the tribes and peoples and tongues. So uh, this is not a small group of predetermined people uh, who are into this little uh, uh, coffee clatch tete-a-tete. -tete. No, this is massive, absolutely massive. Okay. Of all tribes, peoples, and tongues. So it's not restricted to an ethnicity. It's not restricted to uh, a particular race. It's not restricted to anything in that area. It is an eternal liturgy. So this, yes, the uh, the saving sacrifice of Christ was once and for all accomplished. It is finished. But it's eternal because it's in God there. And so it's eternal and applied through all time. So like people would say, well, what about the people who died before Jesus died? What about St. Paul, St. Joseph? Did he get, you know, say, oh, sorry, uh, you didn't get baptized, you died before. So uh, here's a nice uh, place in limbo for you. No. God's grace is not restricted by time and space. <clears throat> this eternal liturgy that the Spirit and the Church enable us to participate in whenever we celebrate the mystery of salvation in the sacrament. So we'll start off there on... 1140 on page 295, 1140 on page 295, next Tuesday, oh, next Monday, today's Monday, Tuesday is the Bible study. This pandemic stuff, it's hard to distinguish the days sometimes. So let's pray the Our Father together. Our Father who art in heaven, 
hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, deliver us from evil. Amen. In the Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come. Here we go. Let's see who's waving today. Abhishek Roy over there in India. Christ is in our midst. He is and always will be. Father Paul Ring. Christ is in our midst. He is and always will be. David Driscoll. Christ is in our midst. He is and always will be. Jack Smith. Christ is in our midst. He is and always will be. Eunice Edia Bonya. Christ is in our midst. He is and always will be. Amber Van, Van Grant, Christ is in our midst. He is and always will be. So have a wonderful day. For God is a wonder. Christ is in our midst. He is and always will be. Bye now.